the Forbes Women Africa interview. First Lady of Namibia, Monica Gainos. Before assuming the First Lady role in 2015, she was a co-shareholder and managing director of Namibia's largest private equity fund for over a decade. Today, I'm very excited to be in conversation with an African First Lady for the Leading Women Summit. She's the First Lady of Namibia, Mrs. Monica Gingos, talking to us from the State House in Windhoek. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Gingos, for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you. Thanks, Renuka. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Most welcome. Um, let me dive right in, uh, Mrs. Gingos. You've had an illustrious uh, corporate career in the capital markets and the Namibian financial services sector. You were known as a lawyer and entrepreneur even before you became the first lady. How did you overcome the general perception that a first lady is only just a shadow of the president as it's usually perceived? How have you managed to turn so, this perception around and lead? I, um, I had a similar perception about first ladies before I became one. So I wasn't offended when I made assumptions uh, or when people made assumptions about me or my capacity. Uh, but what I did do is I quickly realized that um, when people underestimate you, it's not a bad thing. It actually works very much in your favor. Um, and the th second thing that I did is I practiced a longstanding belief that you don't need to be a politician in order to be influential. And don't get me wrong, I think the role of politics is critical in any society. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see people making a huge difference in their communities, in the societies in which they operate, in the industries in which they operate, um, because you don't need anybody's permission or, permi or, or position uh, to lead. And that's really what I did. I just uh, got on with it. That's great. And you've also been far more outspoken than, than a number of the First Ladies. Uh, you do speak your mind, and especially in the recent past, uh, you've spoken about the harassment that women face on social media and the backlash. And that's a very critical area uh, today where women are uh, cannot be seen or, you know, they, they do face backlash of their vote. We've come so far uh, uh, in man's, women's emancipation, but why is it, do you think, that women in the public eye especially are still more subject to such misogyny? Is this what deters more women from joining politics or public service, you think? Yeah, I, th I think there's several barriers that deter women from getting into publics, uh, into politics and the public space. Uh, but I do believe that misogynistic beliefs and mindsets um, and, and the kind of crude insults that we see and the forms of abuse are a real barrier because they, their intent is to put women in their place. So yes, we have made a lot of progress and we must uh, stop and recognize that. But there's still a long way to go um, and changing mindsets, uh, changing societal belief systems is, is, is difficult and it, it takes time. Um, one of the reasons, uh, Renuka, that I'm so outspoken about these issues is that it's often dismissed as something that you should ignore and that you shouldn't engage um, or just dismissed as irrelevant. And um, I'm, at, I'm outspoken about this because I know its impact. I know it's a uh, consequence and, and fundamentally, um, how will you value what I say as a expert if you don't value the essence of who I am? So we must fight and, and, and push against it. So if anybody doesn't respect um, your agency, doesn't um, respect your right to dignity, I think it's important that you remind them um, of who you are. And, and that's really what I, I try and do. Um, it's impossible to, to respond to everything, but there are some times where we need to push back against uh, powerful men or loud voices in society and, and, and hold them to account so that everybody else can see what is happening here is not acceptable. No, that is true. And if you look at the language of political campaigning, campaigning is also so sexist and most of the leadership is, is largely men. Um, having said that, there are also some good certified men out there who can help us lead that dialogue. But then again, uh, uh, Mrs. Gainbos, as someone in a position of power, you also had uh, your fair share of social media trolls and cyberbullying. But how are you in your position working to negate these kind of insults that women face consistently online 
and how are you directing, you know, uh, directing positive change towards such such uh, negative effects in society? It, it, it is very negative. So I, I, I do it from two perspectives. Um, the one perspective that I do it from is from a personal perspective where I do hold people accountable for what they say and do around me. And I do also often use my social capital to push back against sentiments said around me either in private or in public. Uh, because I do believe that at times it's difficult for a woman to defend herself against some of this harassment and abuse. And it's always helpful when somebody else comes in and speaks on your behalf. So, so I do often um, speak on behalf of other women who I feel are being harassed or unfairly targeted as a consequence of their gender. Um, mm -hmm. From an institutional perspective, we, we do a lot of uh, resilience building in, in individuals because I think one thing that we must never um, be naive about is that insults are a consequence um, of being a human being. You, you're going to be insulted. You need to grow a thick skin. So we do a lot of um, resilience building so that people accept that insults are, are part of a game, including gender insults, and that this kind of speech is protected. It's um, freedom of speech. Um, but we also have a view that when people move past freedom of speech and start uh, damaging people's reputations, uh, violating their right to dignity, it's not just an um, in insult anymore. It becomes harassment. It becomes targeted um, and it becomes destructive. Um, so what we try and do is we have a lot of uh, training of police officers, of, um, of um, social workers on what the law does allow for them to follow up when it becomes harassment and targeted abuse. We also assist individuals and their families who've been targeted and affected um, through counseling. We provide them counseling. We also have a number of experts who are attached to my office and their role is when we're not individually involved with a case, we get involved um, at court level where we function as um, expert witnesses. We give um, trauma impact um, statements to courts just to help. We do, um, we assist with um, uh, really fighting against bail um, and, and bringing online violence um, into the real world because there's a point at which there must be consequences because for too long we've accepted that women must suffer the consequences um, of online violence and harassment and it, it is time to turn that table and make the person who is the perpetrator feel the consequence and not the victim. Absolutely, um, Mrs. Gingos. And what about the, the reality on the ground with the female workforce? Last year, for example, the global uh, gender gap report that the World Economic Forum brought out. Namibia is the sixth most gender equal country in the world. That's absolutely remarkable. And clearly there's been, there's been a lot of political empowerment with the, with the closing of the political, political gender gaps. But what about the female, you know, the corporate workforce? Uh, what are the kind of realities there? So Namibia is in an interesting place at the moment where we are seeing more women graduating or more young women graduating from universities, um, which is a good thing in a way, but it's also indicative that uh, we must focus on the education um, and ensuring that both girls and boys stay in school uh, because any form of imbalance isn't good. Excuse me, but what? how does this translate um, in, in the workplace? Um, in the workplace, there's a large pipeline um, of women but we're not doing so great when it comes to um, senior decision-making roles. So we do need to translate this large pipeline um, into equal representation, um, whether it's in cabinet, whether it's at state-owned enterprises, whether it's in the private sector. Um, it's good to have a few women making it to the top, uh, but we need um, a lot more equity um, in that because the decision-makers remain primarily male. We also still grapple with... Um, workplaces, they need to be more conducive for parents. And given the high rate of single mothers in our country, um, we're seeing that these realities aren't always factored into company policies. Um, and this became very pronounced during COVID, especially when it came to, um, to the ability of um, 
parents, particularly single mothers, to find somebody in some way safe where their children could be while they work. But the one thing I really want to highlight, uh, Renuka, is, is um, violence and harassment in the workplace. Um, there have been studies done in Namibia where this is one of the ongoing issues that affect women at all levels in the workplace um, with very little protection for them. So we're very excited and it's good news that um, Namibia has ratified the ILO Convention 190, which um, is against violence and harassment in the world of work. And we are all looking forward to the um, recommendations and the policies that will be redesigned to honor that ratification. Great. That's great. And uh, before I move to the last question, I have to ask you, how are you now leveraging, because Africa seems to be the flavor of the moment for the world, how do you leverage global partnerships? How are you doing that for social impact now? So, because we do a lot of prevention work and a lot of um, advocacy work, it's very important for me personally that we first leverage local partnerships. There's, there's a lot of areas in the advocacy that we do and the prevention work that we do, whether it's in HIV, um, adolescent reproductive uh, health, um, mental health, uh, uh, gender-based violence, a lot of the work that we do is not really fully supported by our private sector. And it's, it's fantastic for us to start seeing more and more private sectors, private sector partners coming on board. It's important for funding and resources um, to come from the country in which you're doing the work. How we leverage global partnerships um, is we've really managed to use our office as a conduit for resources to come into the country, not only to fund the work that we do, but also to fund smaller organizations um, that are based in rural areas. We've done this a lot in the area of HIV. We've also managed to get a lot of gender-based violence related work uh, resourced through global partners. Um, and we've also managed to get a lot of the training that we do, where we do it hand in hand with uh, international NGOs and uh, global partners. So we've managed to use our office as a way to be a connector between the global players um, and partners that we deal with um, and making sure that it uh, kind of trickles down into the rest of the players in the country, particularly those who are in rural areas. That's great. And lastly, what is it like working with the president and alongside him? I'm not sure. He's my husband. So I, I, you can probably ask that question to his cabinet yeah. members and his uh, <laughs> and parliamentarians and opposition politicians. Uh, I'm lucky way. I, I, I get to deal with the good, nice bits um, of him. Uh, he's a great guy. He's, um, it's, it's easy to get along with him. I think, he's, I think I'm obviously biased. He's an excellent politician. But luckily, I don't have to work with him. I think the two of us <laughs> would strangle each other <laughs> to work together. That's all, unfortunately, that we have time for. We'll have to wind up here. Uh, playing the role of connector, Mrs. Monica Gagos, the First Lady of Namibia. Please stay tuned to the rest of the summit unfolding today. Thank you very much.